Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to discuss voltage sagging batteries and, and I'm going to use this water filter to demonstrate it. I'm also going to discuss what causes it and I'm going to go through a couple of different types of batteries and chemistries to show you how it affects each of them. If you're planning on designing a battery, this is definitely something you're going to want to take into account. So let's jump in. Voltage sag is kind of confusing uh, because it's electricity and you can't really see it in action. But this makes it very easy because this is a physical representation of what the electricity is doing inside a battery. So a couple of things to get out of the way. The amount of water this can hold is like the amp hours of a battery. It's the capacity of the battery. The level, the water level of this, is like our state of charge or our voltage. So you can see down here is um, just under 50%. So the higher up this is, uh, the higher the pressure will be at the outlet of this water filter. Now this is the same as the voltage in a battery because um, voltage is electromotive force and pressure is, well, motive force. <laughs> uh, and then finally we have the diameter of our outlet right here which is like the internal resistance of the battery. This is going to limit how much water can flow out of our filter and the internal resistance of a battery is going to limit how much current can flow out of a battery. So let's go ahead and demonstrate this. I'm going to fill this up and we'll check it out. Now I have this tank filled up. Uh, our battery is full and I have the water line right here and I went ahead right here on the side of the sight glass and put a dry erase marker. So that's our original state of charge. And What I'm going to do is open this valve up just a little bit. Maybe we're going to charge up some cell phones and we're going to run a TV. And I'm going to open this a little bit, I'm going to empty it into this, and we're going to watch what this sight glass does. So let's go ahead and do this. So I'm just going to open it somewhat. Alright, you can see that that voltage dropped a little bit. And now let's say our refrigerator kicked on, which is a big inductive load. Look at that sight glass drop. And now as this throttles back, you can see our voltage is rising back up. And now let's say everything shut off. You can see our voltage rises back up, and this is the amount of capacity that we actually use. But you can see that that voltage dropped way down here. So just to give a quick overview of why our voltage sagged, it's because of this opening. If this were a bigger opening, it would be easier for the water to flow out of the, the filter. And likewise, if this were a bigger opening in our battery or a lower internal resistance, meaning the electricity will, f will flow out more freely, that would be the same thing. So the bigger this opening is, the more freely the electrons flow, and the lower the internal resistance. So you might be wondering, why don't they do that with every battery? Why don't they just make a super low internal resistance battery every time they make one for every application if it's better? And the reason is because you, with batteries, you end up with a smaller capacity. So there's a trade-off here. If we had a sight glass that was, say it was plumbed in right to the side of this tank and was independent of our, our valve here, this swing would not have happened. So this is the reason that cheap battery monitors that measure voltage fluctuate so much when loads change. It's because it's just measuring the voltage on the output side of the battery. So if you if you hook up your positive and negative, this is what you're what you're actually reading. You're reading the voltage of the output of the battery, not the actual capacity of the battery. So if you want an accurate reading, of the capacity that you've used, the capacity you have left in the battery, uh, you want a shunt. And a shunt measures this, which is the actual amount of, of electricity that we pulled from the battery, not the change in voltage and where the voltage is at relative to the state of charge of a battery. So now you might be wondering, does every battery do this? And the answer is yes. But they do it in different amounts. So some batteries are designed specifically for high power discharging, like a car battery. It's a 12 volt lead acid battery. And then there's also a 12 volt deep cycle battery. Now the difference between these are, are in the way they're designed. The chemistry is the same, but a car battery is designed to really deliver a punch to start the car. So it can deliver hundreds of cold cranking amps and it's designed to do this. Now a uh, deep cycle battery is designed for a s much smaller amount of power delivery, but it's designed to discharge more deeply. A car battery will be destroyed after just a few deep discharges, um, whereas a deep cycle is built for that. 
So these two batteries are designed based around three things. The depth of discharge needed, the amount of power that needs to be delivered, and the internal resistance. So if you look at something that has a very high uh, power delivery capability, like even with 18650 lithium ion cells, typically if you see a high discharge rated cell, it has less capacity. And that's because there's a trade-off that comes with lowering the internal resistance of a battery and it usually comes in the form of reducing the capacity because of what they have to do in order to lower that uh, internal resistance. So if you want a lot of capacity you usually don't get a ton of discharge capability but if you want a lot of discharge capability you usually have to sacrifice some capacity. So now let's hop onto the computer and look at lead acid discharge curves, lithium ion NMC discharge curves and lithium iron phosphate uh, discharge curves and see what kind of an effect discharge rate has on the voltage sag and overall capacity of the batteries. Alright so this is a discharge time versus discharge current uh, graph for a lead acid battery and so right out of the gate you can see that 0.6 amps 1.2 as you increase the amperage you get a shorter runtime which we would expect but you can also see over here that the voltage that the battery was at as soon as this discharge current was applied is significant. So the more amperage you draw, the more this voltage drops, just like we saw in our sight glass. Now the Pikert effect says that the higher the current discharge of a battery, the less overall energy you will be able to draw from it. So we can see this in action right here, actually. Uh, so this ran for about seven minutes at 36 amps. So seven minutes, out of 60 minutes per hour gives us 0.116 uh, hours of runtime at 36 amps. So that's 4.2 watt hours drawn from the battery if you discharge at 36 amps. And now if we do at one hour, it's 7.2 amps. So we know one hour and 7.2, that's 7.2 watt hours. So 4.2 to 7.2. So just increasing our, our uh, runtime, or I should say decreasing our amperage draw gave us almost twice as much capacity. Uh, and then over here you can see these are hours. So at 20 hours drawing 0.6 amps, uh, we get 0.6, 12 watt hours. So you can see that that increased this even uh, almost double. So this is a lead acid battery, uh, probably a deep cycle. I don't have specifics on it, but this is very similar to what a uh, deep cycle lead acid battery would look like if you tried to do these kinds of discharges to it. I mean, they, they fall on their face uh, with these high amperage discharges and they do exceptional with these lower amperage draws. I don't like lead acid. Uh, I'm a, a lithium fan, more specifically a lithium iron phosphate fan, not only because of the safety factor, but because of what I'm about to show you. Now our next graphs are showing capacity, not a, a time of discharge. So it makes it a little bit easier to see. Uh, this is a lithium NMC uh, discharge curve, and I'm assuming this is a 2 amp hour cell. Uh, this is a 0.2C rate, which would be 400 milliamp hours. Nope, 400 milliamps. Uh, this would be 1 amp, this would be 2 amps, and this would be 4 amps. And again, you can see this voltage sag as soon as they apply these different uh, discharge currents. So the more current you ask of it, the more it's going to sag. Uh, but one thing that's noticeable about this this discharge curve is you still get uh, quite a bit of the overall capacity out of the battery. It's nowhere near as significant as this lead acid where we, you know, doubled doubled our, our watt hours and then doubled it again. You don't really see that here. It's, it's pretty consistent overall. So this is lithium NMC, uh, still some voltage sag going on and it is affected. The capacity is still affected, although not as much. But now let's look at lithium iron phosphate. All right, so here's our voltage over here and this is our uh, discharge ratio. So 100% would be a, a full capacity test. So our bright green is 0.5C. This is 1C, 2C, and 3C. And you can see yet again, there's a, a sag in the voltage. Um, not as pronounced, I would say, but the thing that really stands out to me is that even at a 3C discharge, uh, you get pretty much 100% of the capacity of the, of the cell. So 0.5C extends it beyond that, and that's because most lithium iron phosphate cells are rated at a 1C rate, so you can expect 100% of the rated capacity at 1C. So naturally, if you reduce that to 0.5C, you would expect to get a little bit more because of that Pikert effect. Um, but these obviously are not as 
susceptible to that. They're less uh, affected by that. And this does change based on individual cells. Some cells are rated at 0.5C, some are rated at 1, some are rated at 2. Again, it's, it's all dependent on the type of cell you buy, but this is a good generalization of the different chemistries of batteries and how discharge current and voltage sag affects them. So what did those graphs teach us? Uh, I think first and foremost, lead acid is a horrible uh, chemistry for deep cycle applications. They work and they were really the only option in the past, but we have far better technology now. And both lithium NMC and lithium iron phosphate are better than lead acid, especially in stationary applications. Um, I think that lithium iron phosphate is the best chemistry that can be used for stationary applications where weight is not an issue. If you don't care about energy density, um, then lithium iron phosphate beats lithium NMC or other lithium ion chemistries um, just because of the safety factor. Now there might be some people who are saying, well, what about lithium titanate? And yeah, okay, that, fair enough. You know, those are incredible batteries, but they're still extremely expensive. You can't get them anywhere near as cheaply as the lithium iron phosphate and lithium ion uh, NMC uh, variants right now. The second thing we learned is that the voltage sag is not as severe on lithium NMC and lithium iron phosphate cells. And lastly, we did learn that your application needs to be researched. You need to figure out what you need for your application. If you need to draw a ton of power, you might need to look into either more cells, so that way you can spread that, that load out, or you might need to look into higher capability cells that can discharge at a higher amperage without any kind of long-term damage. Voltage sag exists in every battery, so it's really going to be a matter of finding what you can tolerate for your application. If your project doesn't need big power, um, <laughs> big power, then you don't need to worry about the voltage sag as much because you're not going to be drawing heavy current loads. Spec sheets are usually available for just about every cell that you can find out there, and if you can't find a spec sheet, you should reconsider using those or do more research and find on the internet if other people have found a spec sheet. You really want to make sure that you're using quality cells that are backed up by testing. Um, <laughs> one other thing to point out is that if you want accurate capacity measurements of your battery while it's in service, you need to get a shunt. Um, the voltage readings are fine when there's no load on your battery at all and that state of charge or the voltage can settle to where it's actually at. But lithium iron phosphate, you may have noticed, has an extremely flat discharge curve where 90% or more, uh, not more, uh, where 90% of the capacity is within like 0.1 volts. So you can't really just look at the voltage and be like, yeah, I'm at 72%. You're not going to know. So a shunt where it measures the, the amperage coming out or going into a battery over time is the only way to get an accurate capacity measurement with lithium iron phosphate. And even, even lithium ion uh, NMC is not as reliable. It was a little bit more of a discharge curve but it's, it's not a reliable way of doing it. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, the shunts aren't very expensive. You can, get, you can get a shunt like this that'll read out uh, the watt hours. These may not be the most reliable, but it's gonna give you a better idea of how many amps you've drawn, uh, amp hours, I should say, you've drawn from your battery over just looking at the voltage and guessing. I hope that the water filter sight glass helped you understand voltage sag a little bit better and the effect that amperage draw has on batteries. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like the video or you think I missed something or I should have done something better, give me a thumbs down if you feel it's necessary, but tell me why you don't like the video. We recently did have a big jump in subscribers uh, on the channel and I made the decision that I'm never going to put ads in the middle of my videos. Um, I understand why people do it and, and I get that it's, it's a boost in revenue and all of that. I don't care. Um, I'm not going to do that. I don't really like when it happens. I understand it's part of the process, but if I can avoid it, which I can now, I'm not putting ads in the middle of my videos. As always, thank you all for watching. I really do appreciate it. I'm having a ton of fun making these videos and I'm hoping that they're entertaining for you and I will see you on the next one. So just to give a quick overview of why our Volt our, volt 
So just to give a quick overview of why our voltage sagged so much, it's because of this opening. Uh, this is a small diameter and we're asking for it to deliver more than it can actually deliver without reducing the pressure. So our, oh, that's getting complicated. So now you might be wondering, does every battery do this? And the answer is yes. Because of the physics of how batteries are made and the, um, if, I don't know what everyone else does to wake up in the morning, but I like to start my day with a nice tall glass of electricity. Mm-hmm. Ah, yeah, that's good stuff.